tell me about your favorite books. Welcome to the Left on Red podcast, where we talk about the books you love. With me today is my friend, Jake. Welcome to the show, Jake. Wow. Uh, thank you. It's, it's great to have you. You know, uh, you and I go back actually pretty far because we were uh, friends from college. That is true. We were. You uh, actually were the person that talked me into my entire career plan. So, Is that true? I, I think so. I, we were in a linguistics class. Yeah. And we sat across from each other. And I think I mentioned to you one day that I didn't know what I was majoring in. Okay. And then I can still remember walking out of that class and you were like, oh, you should major in Spanish translation. And I was like so desperate for like a path in life that I was just like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> now here we are. <laughs> you know, that's funny because I remember you already being in Spanish translation when we had that linguistics class, but we met no, in I that wasn't. class. Yeah, I was, I was thinking about majoring in linguistics when we were in that class. Oh my gosh. And then you talked me into taking the test because the test was like the next week or something. Yeah. And I took the test, passed it. And then I was like, all right, I guess I'm doing this. And then we were in all of our classes after that. That's, I mean, I was going to say that's incredible, but ha how did you like it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm actually not working in that field now, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it was fun and it was, uh, it was, it was good for me, I think. So I do appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, um, I mean, it's cool. So I recently relocated and now you and I live closer together. And so it's really cool to reconnect. Um, one of the things that we reconnected about is that you also have a podcast, right? I do. So. Is this my time to uh, shamelessly plug my my content? No, no, do it with, but with complete shame. Okay, I'm ashamed to tell you that <laughs> uh, I have a podcast with uh, my two friends, Brian and Houston. It's called Perfect Brainstorm. It's basically the process of us um, finding a platform to voice all of our dumbest ideas, um, but they're also quite entertaining, I hope. So if you're interested in um, us uh, creating tabletop RPG characters for a fictional Pokemon universe or uh, us inventing holidays based on um, the dancing plague from the Middle Ages, uh, that sort of thing. Look us up, perfectbrainstorm.net um, or, uh, you know, we're all over social media so you can find us and uh, give us a listen. But yeah, that's us. Yeah, I, I actually, I would recommend if you're listening to my podcast and somehow aren't listening to Jake's, I recommend that you go check it out. I've been listening to it for the past couple of weeks and it has been, it's been a ride. That's for sure. I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear that. It, it is, uh, pretty weird, but <laughs> that was kind of the attempted goal. So yeah. <laughs> All right. So Jake, yes. tell me about your favorite books. All right. So I actually had a hard time, uh, deciding because there's a lot of books I like. Um, and so favorite is a pretty strong word, but this was probably one of the books, like th this is one of those books that I'm the most defensive of and the most like passionate about recommending to people. And that's kind of why I decided to pick it, but it is The Shining by Stephen King. And The Shining, by The Shining, you mean like the movie that most people would know? Uh, I mean the exact opposite of that because it's not a movie and it's a book. Okay. Which you need to go read immediately if you have seen the movie or if you have not seen the movie. Okay, so it's what you're going to tell me about today is not a movie, but a lot of people would know that the story is in a movie, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Um, it's uh, and and it's interesting because you know a lot of people, anytime you bring up The Shining, it kind of seems like it's more normal for people to have seen the movie than to have read the book, just because it's you know people watch more movies than they read books, I think. But um, it's like it's pretty. It, it, it's it's very different actually. Um, the, the premise is the same, but the plot points and the themes and the ideas go a lot deeper in the book than what you see on screen. And I will say like, I am a fan of the movie. I watched it and I thought it was entertaining. Um, but it definitely didn't leave the same like impact in terms of like the themes and like the effect that it had on me that the book did. Like the book left me thinking like, holy shit, like that was amazing. Like that made me think of the world differently, you know? Whereas the movie was like, oh, that was pretty spooky and pretty scary and the cinematography was really nice, you know? Um, and it's funny because uh, Stephen King has actually made comments. I don't wanna try and quote him exactly because I'm not sure exactly what it is, but 
he, I think it was something to the effect of like, he referred to the movie and he said, the movie is like a shiny car that doesn't have an engine or something like that. Okay. So he himself has voiced like criticism of the movie and said, he's not that big of a fan. Um, which isn't too out of the, the norm for authors, you know, because I can feel like, I feel like they can be pretty defensive about their work. But in his case, he, he said that the movie did fail to capture the same impact that the book had, which the book is packed with like very personal and very meaningful themes for Stephen King. So anyway, that, that's why I'm a lot more defensive when it comes to like, if you want to watch the movie, watch the movie. I don't care, uh-huh. but you need to read this book. Okay. So for a person like me, because I don't do scary movies and things like that, I end up, I watch like a scary movie and then I can't take a shower for a week because I'm afraid, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like one of the, the bad guys. Come yeah. through the shower curtain. <laughs> exactly. Um, is, is the book similar to like what I understand about the movie? It is. So yes, uh, it's the same basic uh, premise of you have Jack Torrance um, who is kind of this, very thoughtful but very uh, conflicted personality um he's you get the the feeling that he's a little bit unhinged um and he's basically the caretaker of this big empty hotel that gets snowed in for the winter and so it has a lot of themes of you know cabin fever and kind of um going crazy cooped up out in the woods in a snowstorm for several months um the, the, the those themes are the same but you kind of see a very different characters to play out in the book and uh, compared to the movie. But I mean, the book is still scary. Like um, it is a horror novel. Like I remember reading it at night and being like creeped out. Okay. Um, but it goes much, much deeper into the, the, the characters themselves. It, it's a much more personal book compared to what you see on screen because it's, it's so much more about the characteristics the characteristics and the attributes of these people rather than just what's happening in this world around them right gotcha okay so it is still a scary story it is oh man um but you should still read it even if you can't take a shower <laughs> just work from home for a week don't worry about showering <laughs> you know i there's a part of me that wants to read all the books um mm-hmm. that that people bring onto the show and there's a part of me that realizes that that's just not going to happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but given that this is so popular, like I might, I might have to give it a shot. Also, since it's a book, I feel like the, I feel like it's the visual aspects of movies that right. scare me a lot more than reading about them. Yeah, I, I get kind of creeped out by movies. Honestly, I don't like watching like really scary movies. And in fact, watching the The Shining, it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth because a lot of it is just like shock value, you know, right. of the scenes that are depicted. But but I feel like the book is very much not driven by shock value. It's the horror of like what's actually going on in these people's minds and in their their lives that's like creepy. Like, yes, you still do get like descriptive passages of really creepy stuff that's going on. And in fact, uh, my wife, who gets very freaked out by like horror novels and horror books, I just described to her um, the passage I was reading, which is one of the scarier passages in the book. And she told me that she had nightmares just about the passage that I described to her. So make no mistake, it is scary, but I think you'll be a lot less affected by the scariness um, compared to the movie and a lot more affected by the story itself, you know? Yeah, that, that's that's actually really cool. So that leaves me with the question, like as a horror author, um, I, and maybe this is me talking from my my position as somebody who's seen more horror movies than has read horror like literature. How do you make things scary in literature? Ooh, that's a good question. Or, um, or how does uh, how does Stephen, Stephen King, King? Yeah, how does he do that with The Shining? Have you read any Stephen King? I haven't. Okay, so this is what I love about Stephen King. I'll, I think this is a good place to start because I I would love if I can kind of inspire people to just start reading him in general. Um, a lot of people think of him as a horror novelist or even a fantasy novelist because he has the Dark Tower series and different things like that. But he is very, very different from um, like Tolkien or uh, Patrick Rothfuss, who's kind of popular right now. Um, he, he's very, very different or even like Dean Coons. Dean Coons is a very you know popular, just like paperback 
horror novelist, you know? Yeah, for sure. The thing about Stephen King that to me makes his books so, so scary, but also so like enthralling is that he is more focused on the human aspect than the fantastical aspect, right? I actually, I, I do read fantasy and I read sci-fi and I, I like it, but I kind of feel like a lot of modern sci-fi and fantasy writers, they get too caught up in the fantasy and sci-fi of it because it's cool. You know, oh, let's talk about spaceships. Let's talk about magic. Let's talk about wizards. Let's talk about goblins. Um, whereas Stephen King is like, no, let's talk about humans. Let's talk about families. Let's talk about towns. Let's talk about substance abuse. And then let's just sprinkle in some of the the horror elements and the sci-fi elements and so what what makes it so scary in my opinion what i love about stephen king is like it's believable right it's not the, there's nothing scary about a wizard like having to fight a dragon because right. it's never going to happen to you, you yeah know, you're not a wizard and there's no such thing as dragons but being snowed in in a creepy hotel um with a person who's a little bit unhinged it's something that could potentially happen to you and so that's what makes it so freaky is he's so good at making these situations feel real, right? Yeah. Like the, the fantastical elements are shocking even to the characters themselves because it's not necessarily a fantasy world. It's just he's sprinkling in these elements that kind of make you go, whoa, what the hell is going on here? And that's what makes it scary. Right, right. right. So it's like um, we could talk about like aliens and monsters all day, uh, but you want to talk about something really scary, take a look in the mirror. Exactly. Like mm -hmm. let's let's look at let's look at what humans do yeah. rather than all this like supernatural horror like you know an eternity of undying pain and agony. Let let's talk about like that one brief moment where you are scared out of your mind because somebody's in the house. Right. Exactly. Oh my goodness. So how how does how does he do this in The Shining? What are some of like those human or intimate aspects that So uh, well, here's a question for you. Yeah. You mentioned that you haven't seen the film, but you kind of know what it's about. Do you know what the main character's deal is or what what it is about him that kind of drives the story? So I'm I'm actually embarrassed to say this now because I'm starting to realize that I think I'm conflating um, The Shining with A Bird Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Oh, <laughs> different books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and so I don't, so, I mean, would you just explain it for yeah. me? Cause I, I think I'm mixing the Definitely. two up. Um, so I, I feel like I've already kind of hit on the main plot points. You have Jack Torrance, who is caretaker of this snowed in hotel over the winter. Right. He also has his son and his uh, wife with him. Um, but, and this is where it gets really, really interesting. And this is what's totally lost in the film. Um, Jack is about 12 months sober in the book. He is a recovering alcoholic. Okay. And that's something that he's really, really struggling with. And he also has anger issues and aggression issues. Um, he was just, I, I think it's been a while since I've read it. So I might be kind of fuzzy on the details, but um, he was a school teacher. And I think he actually got laid off or fired because of some kind of aggression that happened with a student. Um, and it kind of alludes to him accidentally hurting his child. Like he doesn't openly abuse his child, but he loses his temper and he like, he, I don't know, pushed his kid over or something and sure. sprained his arm or something like that. Um, but a, a big part of the story is the interaction in between him and his kid and him and his wife and him with himself because he's this recovering alcoholic cooped up uh, in this in this hotel with nothing to do but think and look at himself in the mirror, right? Oh, great. And so that that's that's really what it is. You, you, you don't get that in the film. Like in the film, you think, oh, there's ghosts and oh, there's monsters in this hotel, blah, blah, blah. And he's going crazy. And that's what's so scary about it. But what's really scary about it is him trying to cope with his own persona. You know? Yeah. Um, and so what, what but what's interesting about it in and, and the reason I say that it's a much more personal um, story in the book than it is in the movie is uh, if you know anything about Stephen King, you know that he had substance abuse problems. He is a recovering alcoholic and he's, he's even mentioned that he has entire novels, published successful novels that he doesn't remember writing because he was so stoned off his ass. While oh my he was gosh. Them. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I, I think he's been clean for quite a long time now, but um, that book was very much him writing out what it's like trying to, to deal with yourself as an addict or deal with yourself as an alcoholic with all these issues. Yeah. You know, um, I forgot the question you asked because I went off on this whole explanation, but. <laughs> I, so I think um, I, I had asked you about like the horror elements 
uh, as Stephen King presents them as being human or intimate, but like you're kind of getting there. It's like kind of facing your own demons, which everybody does it. Right. Right. So like, like very few people are going to have to deal with like uh, Pennywise. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. (laughs) But everybody has to deal with these demons. Um, but it sounds like the difference is that Stephen King actually has these people deal with them instead of avoiding them like right. you and I probably do. Yeah, exactly. And like there there are overtly fantasy elements to it. Um, like I don't want to, since I'm encouraging people to read this book, I'm not going to spoil anything big, but I will kind of allude to some of the, the themes that go on. Like the boy kind of has this gift where he's able to see things that are happening in the future. And he's also able to see things that happened in the past. Um, this hotel has this very um, gritty and very interesting like history of people who uh, attended it a hundred years ago, like scandals that happened there, murders that happened there. And so there are, there's like connections with kind of the ghosts of these people that still roam those halls. Um, but that's, and, and the, the hotel itself is kind of presented as this supernatural um entity right that is trying to kind of foster evil in these characters um and you see that you you see it trying to interact with um the boy but since the boy is so innocent and so pure uh it actually kind of has a hard time getting to him and then it turns to jack who's such this you know he's such a conflicted tormented soul that being in this hotel it's almost like this evil spirit kind of takes over and amplifies everything negative about him Right. It turns him the the monster that is this hotel and, and its history starts kind of channeling in through this character that's that's stuck in it for the entire winter. Right. OK. Um, so that's yeah. The, the horror element is the, there's definitely elements of it that are like, yes, this is sci fi or this is fantasy or whatever. But but everything is relatable on a human level, which is what I love so much about Stephen King. Right. Right. Well, OK. So this this hotel is kind of this living, breathing, uh, evil entity. Whether it's like actually alive and, and has uh, this like malicious intent or it's just kind of this place where evil things tend to arise, like bubble out forth mm-hmm. from, you know, uh, the cauldron. Um, I don't think that's entirely like unrelatable, mm-hmm. right? Like I think about um, if you take a person, like a vulnerable person and you put them in a, uh, in a place that amplifies the the kind of negative or, or maybe yeah. uh, the vices that they have in their lives, it can really send them into a downward spiral. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's absolutely true. And I, I mean, I luckily don't have ex- firsthand experience with alcoholism or or serious addiction, you know. Um, but I, I have friends who do have firsthand experience with those things. Yeah, and they have actually mentioned to me that. Um, there are so many things about that book that are just like intensely relatable because I, I've, I've kind of heard from people and also just from different sources that addiction tends to thrive under certain circumstances, right? A lot, a lot of how, um, how serious or how aggressive your addiction is, is impacted by the environment that you're currently in. Yeah. And so when you place this person who's trying to recover from alcoholism in this environment, it's kind of a vacuum um but that only lets in evil you know it it creates for an extremely interesting story of him trying to fight that off but not being able to right that's that's very cool so um jake we have to take a break real quick but when we come back i do want to get right back on this topic of like being in a place that in like brings out the worst in you but we'll do that when we come back sounds good Jake, there was something you said um, earlier that I just wanted to mention real quick. So there are spoilers on this channel. If you're listening yeah. <laughs> right now and, and you don't think there's spoilers, I want you to be warned. There are spoilers because um, I want to know like what the book means to you. Mm-hmm. And I don't want you to feel like you can't talk about something in the book, right? right. Um, so feel free to talk about whatever you want. But if if you are insistent that you not spoil it, I will put in the description of this of this episode. Like, there are no spoilers. Yeah. Listen to this if you want to be compelled to to read The Shining, mm-hmm. right? 
Um, so before we left, we were talking about how like people sometimes uh, have these vices or these demons that they're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And there can be things that uh, bring out that, that worst part of them. Right. Mm -hmm. And you had mentioned that, you know, you have some friends that deal with like some serious demons. Um, but I'm stuck with the question and answer this to whatever level you're comfortable. You like the book. I have to assume that you deal with demons. Definitely. Well, I think everybody deals with demons, you know, but I, I will say that, um, it, I was able to connect with it on a personal level in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, I think it's a book, like, I don't, I don't want to put out there that like, you have to be a person who struggles with addiction or have an, an addictive personality to enjoy this book. I think it has something for everybody. Even if you're just a person who wants to read a compelling story and you don't really want to go this far into the weeds to like extract all this, you know, super in-depth meaning and purpose. Um, but something that like, I did see a little bit of myself in Jack Torrance. Of course. Yeah. And I think, you know, kind of getting into the personal aspect of it in the movie, you get this idea that Jack is just a dick, right? He's rude to his wife. He he's rude to his kid. And he ends up going on this murderous rampage where he's trying to kill both of them. And you think it's just because he finally lost his shit and now he's ready to kill somebody. There right? are parts of that I can relate to. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the relatable part for some people. Um, but in the book, I think the reason that I like it so much more is that Stephen King doesn't portray him as the bad guy. He's not the bad guy. In fact, he is, I would argue that he is the protagonist of the story, even though he kind of loses in the end. Okay. Right? And, and so I think... To me, I related with him on a personal level because I saw in him this aspect of myself where I want to be good. I do my best to be good. I try to be good, but sometimes I fail. Sometimes I suck. Sometimes I am a dick. Sometimes I'm not. I don't show up for my friends. Sometimes I'm rude to my wife. Sometimes I go on a murderous I, rampage. Sometimes I try to kill people <laughs> with an axe, like sue me, you know? No, but I think that's something that, that I definitely relate with personally, like fighting with the demons of your own shortcomings. And despite wanting to do the best you can, sometimes you just don't. And like, what do you do in those situations? How do you cope with that? How do you deal with that and like bounce back? You know what I mean? Um, and you know, I, I did find it interesting. Uh, so one little aspect of the book, which I don't know if this is stuck with anybody else, but it's funny how like different people will pull different like tidbits out of the book. Um, he so he's coping with like being sober from this alcohol addiction right and something that is kind of a catalyst that starts leading him back down that road is he starts chewing excedrin as like a nervous tick Ooh. and it's the weirdest thing when you think about it but the way that stephen king describes it like he makes it clear that like this isn't just like a weird quirk that he's given a character. It, it's like some compulsory thing where he just needs that. And and so me, I I read this book. So without getting too far into my uh, personal life, I uh, I didn't start drinking alcohol until I was about 25 years old. Sure. Um, and so I, I read the book before that, but it, I just found that so interesting. Like why would a recovering alcoholic feel the need to chew Excedrin, which is an extremely like acrid, bitter like kind of disgusting taste but then it gives you this little like hit of something right yeah because it's like super caffeinated right exactly super caffeinated and it's also a painkiller so it kind of it gives you this it Feel kind good. of chills you out while also giving you some energy um well now i i enjoy a glass of whiskey from time to time you know sometimes i enjoy two glasses of whiskey and whiskey <laughs> is also a it's a pretty acrid pretty bitter flavor but there's something about it that like it just it's strong and it hits and then it feels good, right? And so I, I know now, having experienced that, that Stephen King was writing from very personal experience that Jack was just, he was yearning for that type of, of stimulus, right? And so he chews the Excedrin. Um, anytime he like gets stressed or anytime he's upset about something, he pops an Excedrin in his mouth and he just chews it up. And uh, I remember one time I was in a class at BYU and I had a, I get migraines. And so I take Excedrin every once in a while. 
And I was sitting in this uh, BYU class and I had some Excedrin in my backpack and I felt a migraine coming on and I didn't have any water with me. And I remembered that scene in The Shining or the multiple scenes where he chews Excedrin and I was like, huh, I'm just curious about this. Oh no. <laughs> so I popped an Excedrin in my mouth and I just started chewing it up. I literally like almost had to leave the classroom mm -hmm. because it is so vile, yeah. like so disgusting and it coats your entire mouth. Like it gives you cotton mouth <laughs> and you just like almost can't swallow and it takes all of the saliva out of you. Um, and so that like added more to this of like, Jack Torrance is so desperate for this addiction that he is like fighting so aggressively that he is willing to get his fix from something so like disgusting. You yeah. Know? Um, and, and I just found that interesting, like returning to the original question, the original point. Um, it's, it's very, it's very sad, but it's also very reassuring to kind of realize that like, oh, I'm not the only person in the world that deals with really, really heavy things and sometimes has very serious shortcomings in those areas. You know, that's a very human thing to fail at, at what you're trying to accomplish and to fail at what you're trying to resist. The whole story is really a story of him resisting his evil side, him resisting the side of himself that he doesn't like. And, you know, since we're now on the same page that spoilers are okay. Yeah. He does fail in the end. And um, it's, I'm of the opinion that just because a book is, doesn't have a happy ending doesn't mean it's not a good book i love I, tragedies yeah and and i think there's a reason why we as people like tragedies it kind of gives us comfort to realize that like hmm sometimes life sucks and shitty things happen and that's life like that's normal it's okay like we just have to accept it and accept the consequences of whatever happens you know sure anyway no so i i personally love tragedy um but maybe because it's one thing for shitty things to happen. It's another thing for the end all be all to be a shitty thing, right? right? It's mm -hmm. like, cause you're like, oh, shitty things happen and that's okay. But like the end of it all was shittiness. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's, that's different from it's, it's okay. That's like a whole nother level. Like it doesn't even matter. Right. Well, and it's, and that's a whole other topic we could get really, really into, you know, it is it's, it is sad, but sometimes people um, kind of live these sad lives and have a sad ending. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the overall story of humanity or the overall story of whatever we want to call existence is a tragedy in the end. Because the, the book does, it, it ends with Jack, you know, kind of giving way to all of his temptations, giving way to all of his, his weaknesses. He goes on this rampage. He, he kind of loses complete control of himself. Right. Mm -hmm. And he pays the ultimate cost for that in the end. The without, I don't want to, I'm not going to spoil the details so that you're still interested in how this happens, <laughs> but uh, he kind of gets absorbed by this hotel and he becomes a part of it that he can never escape from. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that sucks for him, but you also do get an afterword of what is the life of his wife and his child now like because that happened, you know? And you do get to see, oh, like they are heartbroken because they lost a husband and a father who they genuinely loved despite all of his weaknesses and shortcomings. But they have now opened a new chapter in their lives and they are living a life that is more peaceful because they're not being impacted by all these negative things happening because of that person's um, struggle. Yeah. You know, that's that's so interesting because that clearly like relates to situations that people go through in life, mm -hmm. opening up new chapters and closing like painful ones um, is, is something that people go through and that can be difficult, but very, very like uh, therapeutic and healing for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's very interesting. Um, can I share a quote? Absolutely. I did prepare a few of my favorite quotes and, and it's interesting, you know, uh, talking about this and talking about my opinions and then looking up kind of the most popular quotes from this book and kind of people's opinions on it. Um, I'm just struck by how right I am about everything. <laughs> I, I wish the, I had that problem. One of the top quotes on Goodreads uh, is a passage where Jack is talking to his son, Danny. And I, I think this is a very interesting passage that we could discuss. And he says, the world's a hard place, Danny. It don't care. 
It don't hate you and me, but it don't love us either. Terrible things happen in the world, and they're things no one can explain. Good people die in bad, painful ways and leave folks that love them all alone. Sometimes it seems like it's only the bad people who stay healthy and prosper. The world don't love you, but your mama does, and so do I. Oh, wow. That's an interesting, interesting quote, you know? And, and I like it because to me, it says there are a lot of things about your life that are going to suck. There are a lot of tragedies that are going to happen, but there are a lot of little things that can outweigh. Uh, there are a lot of little good things that can outweigh the big bad things, you know? And, and I like that. I think the story is not just this nihilistic look into how shitty human existence is. It's how is life beautiful in spite of how shitty human existence is? You know, yeah. that's what I really am kind of caught up by in this book. I'm, I'm starting to see that there's a lot of symbolism and a lot of figures in this book uh, that, are, that are leading to this idea of like, what does it even mean uh, if, if things are ugly and if things mm -hmm. are painful? Um, yeah. and, and what's the point? But there, it sounds like there obviously is a point to it all. Definitely. Definitely. And I think that, you know, Stephen King was, was writing from a very, very real place of him kind of grappling with all of these things for his whole life. But he, you know, I'm sure he's found meaning in his writing. He's found meaning in his family, uh, despite having struggled with all these same things that Jack has struggled with. And he's kind of determined that, uh, in the end it's worth it. You know, yeah. it's, it's worth it to try. It's worth it to give it your best shot because it's, you know, this life is what you got. So uh, if you try to make the most of it, you're going to find that there's more positive than negative in the end, you know? Sure. Or at least the, the positive matters more. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So fr from everything you've told me, you've, you've taken this kind of monster of a man um, that, that I see in like, you know, imagery and, and television and stuff like that. And I'm starting to see a sympathetic figure of like a person. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, the thing that you were talking about that really caught my attention is how he chews on Excedrin. And mm -hmm. like, <laughs> it, I think it's really funny that you have your own personal experience with, <laughs> with chewing on yeah. an Excedrin, right? <laughs> um, it's this horrible, terrible experience, uh, but he chooses to do it. And I can't help but think of like the pain that he must be going through, the emotional mm -hmm. pain or psychological pain that he's going through because of his, his own struggles that it's, it's, it's so chronic and it's so prevalent in his life that he decides I want to feel anything other than what I'm feeling right. now. And so mm -hmm. I'll chew on this Excedrin. Uh, I feel like that's incredibly sympathetic or just being the anti-hero in your own story. Like I, I'm generally an average person and I can do things, but for some reason I just always sc like screw it up. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so how does one, or I mean, maybe Stephen King talks about this a little bit. How does one balance that to prevent the, what, what I am kind of seeing is like going over the edge. Like mm -hmm. I'm unhinged, but how do I keep the door on the hinge instead of like just right. coming off the handle, right? Um, that's a really, really good question. And I think, I, I feel like the one like fatal flaw that Jack Torrance has you know, you, you might think, oh, his fatal flaw was his alcoholism or his fatal flaw was his addiction or or his aggressiveness or his anger management. But I think a big part of it was, you know, he never should have put himself in that situation where he was trapped with nothing to do in a hotel all winter with his family who he wasn't giving enough attention, care and compassion to, you know, and I think that's in the end what it was. And I think, I, I mean, I'm not going to put words in the author's mouth. And I think a lot of times people will try to do that and say, oh, well, Stephen King meant this or that. I'm sure he had his own meaning, but the meaning that I extrapolate from it is that, you know, he, he put himself in an evil environment. He, he put himself in an environment that, that was not conducive to the weaknesses that he already had. And that in the end was his downfall. You know, I think... For those of us that have different types of weaknesses, it's important to identify in what situations do we buckle and in what situations do we thrive and seek out the situations where we thrive. Because sometimes I think it's a little bit arrogant to assume that we have control over ourselves in any situation. Some people think, oh, I'm strong enough to resist this or that. I'll just, you know, sheer willpower. But humans just don't work that way. You know, humans um, are impacted by external factors every single day. 
And so the most I think we can do is like try to influence what external factors are at play in our own lives, you know, to, to try and avoid these types of situations. Anyway, that's, that's getting like fairly, uh, you know, liberal in my interpretation of things, but that's <laughs> what, <laughs> that's what I take from it, you know? No, I think when Stephen King wrote The Shining, he was thinking about the, uh, trivial ways in which people hurt themselves and hurt the people that they're around. <laughs> he was thinking, spe- oh, yeah. <laughs> he was thinking specifically of, you know, that annoying thing that you do to your wife, right? Yeah. Can I, can I take a quick side note real quick? Yeah. I want to get on a soapbox about one little thing. Please do. Um, have you read the book Watership Down? I have not. Okay. There's a book called Watership Down and it's the story of, um, bunny rabbits and their quest to find a new warren or a new place to live. Oh my when... gosh, I've seen the animated film. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, there's an animated film about it. And uh, he, so it's this whole epic quest of this family of bunnies trying to find a new home after humans move in and put a housing development on their settlement, right? And uh, he, so the, the author um, got a lot of attention over this book and it started getting read in high school classrooms and in college classrooms. People started analyzing it. They started pulling meaning out of it. And they started to say, wow, it's amazing how the author made a metaphor for life. It's amazing how the author alluded to the evils of capitalism and this and that. And the author actually wrote a foreword to the book after all of this attention happened where he said, I just want to make something clear. Um, this story was born out of me uh, making up stories for my daughters on long road trips all of those things that people have taken out of this, I really didn't have in mind. I just wanted to write a story about bunnies. <laughs> and so I, I, people always get caught up on like, what did the author mean? Or what did the author try to tell us? And I think it's kind of, if, if you go down that route, you're kind of analyzing in vain because it's not about what the author tried to come up with. It's about what do you take out of it, right? What do you see in the content that maybe even the author didn't see themselves? Right. Right. I like looking at things through that lens. So that, that's my, my, you know, two minute soapbox on, on literary analysis that like <laughs> I, none of the things I say, I'm not pretending that I know the mind of Stephen King, but this is what I get out of it. And I think it's, I, I like that, that style of analysis because it gives you the liberty to say, this is what it means to me, or this is what it means to certain people. Um, the author, I don't give a shit what they thought it meant because, <laughs> you know, they're not sitting in my chair with a microphone, but, um, we can all look at it and take, you know, everybody can get meaning out of different things. So. Absolutely. I mean, so thank you for taking a moment to get up on that soapbox and remind us, um, you know, that authors may or may not have intended meeting. And it mm-hmm. is something that's important to keep in mind. Uh, but at the same time, what matters to you is what the book means to you, what the story mm-hmm. means to you. If I mean, if it wasn't for that meaning that you derived from it, that book wouldn't have even sold or that, you know, that, that copy wouldn't be in your hands. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but apart from that, and I'm not claiming <laughs> like you to, to be an expert in literary analysis, but I, I'm tempted to, um, think of, of authors as being in some ways a product of their time. Mm-hmm. Right. And it, I mean, you know, you and I took a couple of literature courses at, uh, in college where we kind of talked about like, you know, these writers from this era were writing about these topics. Mm-hmm. Like it's inevitable, even if a writer is quote unquote ahead of his time, yeah. um, they're writing about the th- same things because that's what's relevant to them. Um, and so, you know, when, <laughs> when these people are talking about, uh, you said Watership Down is the name of this, this yeah. book, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when people talk about like, oh, it's interesting how he, you know, was able to encapsulate like, the story of what's occurring uh, contemporarily around him, he might not, might not have even realized that he was. It may not have been a conscious thing, but at the end of the day, it's his work and right. it's it's my meaning, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Um, well, we're going to take another break and uh, we'll be back in a minute. Sounds good. So Jake, this has been really fun. First of all, because I I know this book because everybody knows the movie, mm-hmm. right? And so I feel like I feel like I'm familiar with it. It's kind of like when people say like that they know the classics. Like a uh, who was it? Louis L'Amour said, 
A classic is just a book that everybody talks about, but nobody's read. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and so I feel like I'm experiencing The Shining because I know just enough about it to like get by with these points that you're giving me, you know? Right. Um, but that's that's a side note. This is about you, Jake. This is about what the book means to you. Um, and on that note, I actually wanted to know because now we have like these intimate details about the book that that are meaningful to you. But you were so adamant earlier about um, that the book's better than like the film adaptation mm-hmm. and pop culture references. What well, what is it about those pop culture references that makes them not as shiny as The Shining? <laughs> I like your your wordplay there. That's nice. I got lucky on that one. <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, I think Stephen King summed it up perfectly when he called it when he called the movie a shiny car without an engine. Yeah, Stanley Kubrick, like it. it this is the thing. Stanley Kubrick created an objective good work of art. Like it is good in the sense that, but, but he was focused on fundamentally different things than Stephen King was focused on. So I almost kind of wish that Stanley Kubrick had written his own script and come up with his own story to channel all of his inspiration that he channeled into The Shining on, right? Okay, yeah. Um, because he was very focused on aesthetics, visuals, mood, the color of the room, the layout, the facial expressions, the, you know, the aggression between Jack and his wife. It was much more sensationalized, I feel like, than what you experience in normal day to day life. Um, and, you know, I kind of already mentioned this, but Stephen King, it's so believable that you think, oh, this is the person I could bump into in the street. This is someone who works in my office. This right. is someone who lives at my apartment complex, you know? Um, and so, yeah, like I said, Stanley Kubrick came up with a really good work of art, but I I'm, I'm, I almost feel like it's a shame that The Shining as a whole has been reduced to, to Kubrick's interpretation rather than King's interpretation. Because it's so much easier to watch a movie than it is to read a 500-page book, what people remember is the scene of the, the twin girls in the hallway or the boy riding the trike down the, the hallway with the paisley carpet or whatever, yeah. or the, the blood coming out of the elevator, right? People remember the visuals. They remember the aesthetics. They, you know, the, the most popular thing is um, Jack uh, not knocking down the door with the right. axe, sticking his head in and yelling, here's Johnny. Right, right, right. I don't even know if that happened in the book. I think, I mean, that scene happened. I don't know if he said, here's Johnny, <laughs> but that's like, it's almost a meme because of how sensationalized it is and how over the top it is and how, uh, you know, like just otherworldly that whole thing is where, the the real gritty like story lies in the reality of who these people are. You know, it's something that happens every day across the country. The the story that these people are playing out. Sure, sure. So now I'm left with the question because you talked about like the scene with the with the twins in the hallway and the boy on the on the tricycle. Does that happen in the book? I mean, the book. So the boy definitely has a large uh, role in the in the story because he is the one that has. So the, they refer to it as the shining, as the ability to see into the future, see into the past. Oh, um, <laughs> I didn't even know that. <laughs> right. Well, well, that's what's funny about it is you don't focus on that when you're reading the book. Like, did he ride a tricycle down the hall? I don't know. Maybe he might have in some, some scene. But the narrative was much more worried about what he was thinking as he rode that track down the hall than what the color of his track was and what the facial expression was as, as he like rode past these paintings. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so like I, I don't even... And like I said, it's been a while since I read the book, but I probably couldn't even tell you if those scenes play out uh, in, the, in the book like they do in the movie. But I think that at the very least, Kubrick leaned heavily on the visuals that he wanted to capture rather than the, the experience that these people were having. Right. And I think is, that's what you're getting at when you say like it's a work of art in its own right. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's an amazing work of art, you know? Uh-huh. Like I think of... Um, I don't know if you've seen many Wes Anderson films. I wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> so Wes Anderson is a, uh, he's a very, very quirky director. Um, and, and in my opinion, he writes a very, very good story. So I'm not saying he doesn't write good stories. Okay. But he also um, has kind of this, this style where he considers every shot a painting. He's like every, sh- every shot that we frame of the characters and the setting and the objects in the shot should look like a nice painting. If you were to take a screenshot, you should be able to hang that on your wall and it looks nice. 
Right. So he, does your wallpaper on your yeah, PC. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, he doesn't just think of, uh, of filmmaking as a vehicle to deliver a story, but he thinks of it as its own aesthetic work of art. Yeah. And Kubrick is very, very good at that. It's, it's an amazing a work of art in that right. I just feel like that's why I say I wish they had been two separate things because he loses so much in his attempt to capture that. You know, it's like when you chase two rabbits, you catch neither of them. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Like he caught, he, Stephen King caught one rabbit and Cooper caught another one. I happen to like Stephen King's rabbit more. Yeah. But um, what I'm really, really getting at here is that if you've seen the movie, you haven't experienced Stephen King's The Shining. And I, I'd also say if you've read the book and haven't seen the movie, you haven't experienced Cooper's The Shining. Right. But they're two fundamentally different things. You yeah. Know? No, that's, that's totally fair. I, I get what you're saying. You're like, uh, like the the imagery has its own sort of uncanniness or creepiness, mm-hmm. uh, exactly. and this this uh, inherent value that that it, that it provides, but it's a symbol that references or alludes to this story that you know. And being somebody who values that story, you yeah. you want um, you want that value to come from the imagery, right? Right. I mean, my question to you is: Do do you think the imagery? reflects accurately the book in some ways yes but i feel like in a lot of other ways no because what you get in the movie you get a lot of imagery that shows um jack's aggression right his facial expressions when he talks to his wife or like there's a scene where his wife comes down the stairs and is talking to jack you know jack is a writer and so he sits at his typewriter in this huge empty room um it's like this it's like a ballroom and he sets up a desk right in the middle of it and he sits on his typewriter so it's a it's a very good aesthetic it's a very good mood right they're setting here the wife comes down and like the way that he looks at his wife the way that he talks to her is very aggressive and very combative in a lot of ways and so that is accurate in the sense that that did happen in the book but you don't get the other side of him right you don't get the positive interactions that happen between Jack and his family. And you can't see inside his brain. And, and I think that's what, you know, people that argue that the book is already always better than the movie. I try not to be one of those people because I think they're like annoying as hell. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Who <laughs> were like, oh, the book is always so much better than the movie. But what the book has going for it is that you can see inside the mind of a character in the way that a movie can't do unless you have a constant narration going on. Right. Right. And so when you read the book and you you uh you know see this interaction of jack and his wife and him making angry facial expressions and like little quips that are kind of meant to set her off you think when you're reading the book you think oh this man's really tortured and he hates himself because you're seeing his whole train of thought that's leading him as to why he's saying those things it's because he's so bent out of shape so stressed he wants a drink so bad right that's why he's saying these things in the movie you just think oh this guy's a dick right i hate this guy like i would never want to hang out with him but you have a whole different sense of empathy reading into the mind of the character and understanding what he's thinking as he does these things you know? yeah no that's understandable and with a movie you also can only keep the attention of your audience for so long right and with a book i can put it down and come back to it you know yeah mm-hmm. so that makes sense so and here's a little look behind the scenes to those of you who are listening uh, during the break, I asked Jake if he remembered um, that The Shining was used as kind of a staple of this movie, Ready Player One. Um, so there are obviously other references to The Shining outside of just the film adaptation that everybody knows. Mm-hmm. Are you familiar with any any other? I so I haven't seen Ready Player One. Okay, but I, I want to I want to guess to see if I can guess what they pulled from. The Shining into a movie like Ready Player One. Okay, cool. Go ahead. Did they have um, like animated topiary animals? Oh, you have to tell me what that word means. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I guess not. In The Shining, <laughs> at the end of it, the uh, a topiary is a sculpture made out of a bush, right? Oh, yeah. Then like, you sculpt a bush into a horse, or you sculpt a bush into a lamb. It was not. It was not a. Uh, it was not meant as like a featured part. Uh-huh. of uh of the scene where they were doing the, all the uh the shining stuff but he walked through like kind of like a labyrinth mm-hmm. um i'm not sure that it was actually a labyrinth but it was like you know with bushes and all that and yeah. i do know that they had some some 
of those things that you were talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that, at the end of The Shining, uh, b- because of this whole concept, the the hotel is kind of alive and it has its spirit of its own. Yeah. Um, as Jack is trying to fight back, there's a, there's a really like interesting scene where the 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 bush sculptures or the topiaries come to life and okay. like are actually moving around and running around and chasing people and blah blah blah. I don't believe that they are moving around. I believe that a character just ends up running through like the garden or I see. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and see that's I think that's another key difference that you see between the book and the movie. In the movie, they played very heavily into this labyrinth, like maze thing. Mm-hmm. I think because it made for a lot of really good shots, you know. Of course, yeah. I don't, I don't even think there was a maze, a hedge maze in the book. It was just like a garden with some topiary animals that like oh, that were moving sense. around. So, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, that was in it. And then apart from that, I'm sure you could guess like the other shots that would have been in the um, in Ready Player One. Let me think about it. And the thing is, too, that the inspiration for the story in Ready Player One is the movie, not the book. Right, right, right exactly. And so I'm trying to think of like the most visually iconic parts. I think that the axe and the door probably would have been a big one. Yes. Um, there was no Here's Johnny. Okay. It was, and it might, although I think it was an axe, but I think during that scene, there was like a, like a, either a witch or like a zombie woman. Huh. Who was trying to kill somebody in the bathroom? Oh, okay, yeah. So there's a very uh, there's a very kind of visceral scene of a woman who I, I believe the the narrative is that there's a woman who died in a bathtub or something, mm-hmm. and uh, it's actually the boy in, in the book. And I, I'm trying to remember the difference between the book and the movie. In the book, it's actually Danny, the little boy, who wanders into the room and sees her first. Okay. I think Wait, I or like a real woman, a real dead woman, or like The Shining. Like he, well, it's kind of the same thing to him. Sure. I um, mean, that's kind of what's so freaky about it is he's seeing the past and future of this hotel, so he sees past, um, you know, visitors of this hotel as if they were standing in a hallway or standing right. in the bathroom, or whatever. So he walks into this, this uh, you know, haunted hotel room where somebody died in the bathroom, and he sees a woman dead lying in the bathroom. Laying, lying in the bathtub and it's full of blood and stuff right yeah that for me that was like the scariest scene in ready player one okay yeah <laughs> see and that i think a lot of people would say that's the scariest scene in um in the shining i believe it uh but it kind of grossed me out to be quite honest like and they, they took a very different spin on it and and they almost like so th- i think i could be wrong on this some people might listen to this and say i'm full of shit but I think what happened in the movie is Jack was actually the one to encounter the woman and they like sexualized it. Like they almost made it seem like she was like this young woman that he was like lusting after. Okay. And then she came out of the bathtub naked and he like hugged her and started kissing her and stuff. And then she like turned into this old dead woman. And it's just like this repulsive moment of like, Ugh! and she's like all scabby and covered in blood and stuff. And, and I just remember in the book being like, Oh my God, like Danny just saw like the you know, ghost of the hotel's past and it's horrific moments. And when I watched the movie, I was just like, Ugh, that's nasty. Yeah. Like, <laughs> just okay. kind of grossed me out. Um, in, in, in Ready Player One, I, no, I don't remember that movie all that well, but mm-hmm. I do believe that they did the same thing where it was like kind of sexual at first, but then she slowly turned into like mm-hmm. nasty. That's why I said zombie woman, because that's what yeah. I'm remembering is that part. But I mean, other than that, there wasn't really a whole lot. It was mostly like the blood filling the hallway and the yeah. twins. And I do believe there's a tricycle like rolling down the hallway. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so that is The Shining by Stephen King. So, Jake, um, these are some questions that I want to ask everybody that I have on the show. The first one is if you had to rate The Shining, and compare it to all books that were ever written. How would you rate it? And use your own scale to rate it. All right. I put a little bit of thought into this. Okay. And um, hopefully this is a, another uh, persuasive element that will talk people into at least giving this book a shot. I'm not the kind of person to like read a book all in one stretch, but I'm pretty sure I read this book in one or two days. And it's like 500 pages or something like that. Okay. 
Um, and I finished it probably at about four o'clock in the morning because once it really got into the heat of things and they were in the hotel and Jack was starting to go crazy and he's starting to battle these demons and these supernatural things were starting to happen all around him. I just couldn't stop. And so I am rating this book um, six out of eight hours of sleep lost. <laughs> and you could consider that due to the fact that it's enthralling and you want to keep reading or due to the fact that you can't sleep because it freaked you out too bad. Um, oh, that, yeah. That's my rating. On, no, very on my cool. scale, on my scale, more hours of sleep lost means a better book. So this is high on that scale. Of course, because instead of sleeping your eight hours of sleep a night, you stayed up for six of them reading the book. Exactly. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> very cool. All right. You heard it here, folks. Uh, six out of eight hours of sleep lost. Um, great. Fantastic. And the second question I have is, who would you recommend this book to? I would recommend this book to anyone who wants both a story that is um, captivating and thrilling and exciting, um, but is also looking for something that they can extract some deep meaning out of. I, I mentioned earlier, like it specifically is about people who are struggling with addictions. I think those people can find special meaning in it, but I also think anybody who is a human being and just likes to understand more of what it's like to be a human being with different types of uh, challenges in life will get a lot out of this book. Or if you just like scary stories, you'll also get a lot out of this book. So I, I guess my answer is everyone. 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 <laughs> <laughs> okay. Everyone either wants to get more out of life or wants to read a scary story. And that is the dichotomous nature of life. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, Jake, it has been an absolute pleasure uh, having you on the show. Thank you so much for, for joining me. Yeah. Um, it's my pleasure. Yeah. So for the people at home, um, we'll, uh, tweet out a link where you can buy the book on, on Amazon. Um, and also put that in the episode description, I believe. If you'd like to follow us on Twitter, we are at left on red books, uh, where the left on red books podcast on Instagram. And of course you can email us if, uh, you have anything you'd like to share with Jake or me or any of the other guests on the show. Um, Jake, would you like to remind everybody about your awesome podcast? Yeah. Um, if you want to uh, see me in a much less thoughtful and <laughs> introspective <laughs> environment, <laughs> look up Perfect Brainstorm and you can uh, get a, an idea of what I am like when I'm just dicking around and trying to come up with stupid ideas. So, well, you know, brainstorm. <laughs> it, may be, it may be less thoughtful, but it's not any less brainstormy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's brainstorm-tastic. Yeah. Well... <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for being here and thank you, Jake, for telling me about your favorite book. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on.